Today, a deep dive into lending flows. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The ABS has released their latest loan flow data today to the end of December 2019. And in their media release, they trumpet that new loan commitments for housing rose 4.4%. The value of new loan commitments for housing rose 4.4% in December, seasonally adjusted according to the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics figures. ABS Chief Economist Bruce Hockman said strong growth in the value of new loan commitments for housing during the second half of 2019 has seen the series increase 20.7% from the most recent low point in May 2019. New loan commitments for unoccupied housing was the prominent driver of this growth, up 22.8% since May 2019. The value of new loan commitments for investor housing while tracking upward over the past six months remained down on the March 2017 peak. The number of loan commitments for unoccupied first home buyers rose 6.2% in December following subdued first home buyer activity over the prior three months. December's rise was the second strongest of 2019 with unoccupied first home buyer commitments up 21.3% on December 2018. And the value of personal finance fixed-term loan commitments rose 3.5% in December, following a 1.1% fall in November, and were up 7.9% on December 2018. And in trend terms, the value of new loan commitments to businesses for construction fell 0.2% in December, and the value of new loan commitments to businesses for the purchase of property fell 0.5%. So on first blush you'd say loans are definitely on the up. And also Westpac, that also publishes analysis of the data from the ABS, starts by saying housing finance upturn strengthens. Owner occupied number 3.5% over the month, investors by value 2.8% over the month, and the total value up 4.4% over the month, And they start by saying that the December housing finance report showed a stronger than expected finish to 2019. The total value of housing loan approved a surge 4.4%, well above consensus expectations of 1.6% over the month. And then they go on to look at the detail and highlight the fact that the bulk of the loan growth is in unoccupied land, while lending for investment purposes did pick up, but is showing milder gains and is subdued compared to previous peaks. And they do make the point, and it's a very important one, that it should be noted the finance survey was overhauled late last year with changes to coverage and definitions in some areas. Now, the point I want to make is that all of the analysis that's published generally looks at the seasonally adjusted data series. But I have a problem with that for two reasons. The first is that the seasonally adjusted data is abnormal this year simply because of what's happened to the market over the last few months. And secondly, the change in methodology that the ABS has used means that the seasonally adjusted data may or may not be right. So I'm a bit more sceptical than they of the situation with regard to what's going on. So I've done my own analysis, which is based on the more reliable trend data which essentially is designed to iron out some of the lumps and bumps across the series. And what I want to do now is to compare what the ABS and what Westpac has said with the trend series data. So we'll start by looking at new home lending flows to December on a 12-month trend basis. And indeed, owner-occupied lending has definitely started to rise. You can see that the drop was down to March 2019 and then it started to rise from May and is now just below 20%. So that's pretty convincing, I think. Investment lending also significantly down, way down in fact, significantly down, nearly down to 30% back in March and then up towards about 8%. And first-time buyer lending, again, a similar dip and rise 
and uh, more than 30% higher. But the thing to understand about the 12-month trend is that, of course, you'd expect it to very strongly bounce back because it was so over the last 12 months. In other words, as you lose data that was going down significantly, you're going to get a rise now. So the 12-month series during the dynamic change of momentum actually could be deceptive. And to show you what I mean, let's look at the same data over a three-month trend series. And now we see, yeah, some rise in owner-occupied lending. But in fact, the rate of change has slowed over the last two or three months. And investor lending is also slowing. And in fact, it's um, still in positive territory, but the rate of change is declining. And first-time buyers are up 10% over a three-month trend series but nevertheless are not rising as much as they were. So here is a slightly different story. Yes, there is some growth in lending, but to say that the rate of change is accelerating seems to me to be slightly off the mark. And just to complete the picture, we can also look at the monthly trend data. And again, we see owner-occupied lending growth still in positive territory, but definitely slowing down slightly. Investment loans even more so, below 2% now relative to September. And first-time buyers, again, quite positive, but nevertheless not really a huge amount of growth. So now let's go into a more detailed set of analysis and we'll start with the purchase for construction of new dwellings. And firstly, we see the number of loans and the number of loans indeed have risen. It's now at 0.5% and this is monthly trend data. But what's shocking is that the trend value lent has really risen very significantly. So what we're seeing is a small rise in the number of loans being written, but the average loan size growing considerably faster. And this is the secret to understand what's going on at the moment. And we can see somewhat similar trends if we look at the owner-occupied purchase of newly erected dwellings. And here, in fact, the growth in the number of loans has come off from its peaks in July, August time. It's still sitting at 3%, which is still a healthy clip, but it's not as fast as it was. And the value is also turning down now. And that, of course, is mirroring the two. So there isn't quite the same degree of disparity between the number of loans and the average loan value. But if we then look at the trend on occupied purchase of existing dwellings, we see the number rising quite significantly. It's more than 1%. And again, we see the value of loans growing even faster. So once again, volumes are increasing, but the average loan size is increasing significantly faster. And then we can also look at the refinancing trends for owner occupation on a monthly basis once again. And we, in fact, see that the number of refinance transactions has dropped. And that's not surprising because, of course, interest rates were taken down and people will have refinanced to lower rates where they could. And the value is also down from a significant peak. But I want to highlight again that we did have that same disparity where the average value grew much more significantly than the number of loans, which means that people were drawing down larger loans. And let's just look across the states to see how the total owner-occupied monthly value changed. This is again to December 2019. So in New South Wales, we had considerable growth, but it peaked in September and is now continuing to grow but at a lower level. Victoria, a little bit later and a slight downturn now. Queensland, a little later still, but just a slight downtick this time. South Australia, also a slight decline, still growing, but not quite as fast. Western Australia, a little bit of an increase over recent months, now going sideways. Tasmania, falling, in fact, into negative territory, and then rising slightly, but still shrinking, because it's still actually in negative territory at the moment. And the Northern Territory's significant volatility, but of course the Northern Territory volumes are very low, so there's a lot of volatility in these series, and I wouldn't read too much into that uh, significant spike up. And you could say the same about the ACT, slightly larger transaction volumes, but nevertheless we've got the same issue, that the volumes are quite low, and we are seeing the rate of change 
declining. And now let's look at the investor series and I've stripped out the refinance data. So this is looking at new investor loans and we're going to look across the states once again. So in New South Wales we did see a rise in investor lending up to about 2% now going sideways. But in Victoria it rose a little earlier to closer to 3% and is now back down to 2%. Still, still growing but not as fast. In Queensland, it's also sliding back, so the rate of growth is easing. In South Australia, the opposite is true. It's accelerating slightly, up towards 2%. Western Australia is easing down. In fact, it's close to zero, but not quite at zero. Whereas in Tasmania, we're seeing a slight decline in investor lending at the moment. In the Northern Territory, significant spike, but again on very low volume, so I wouldn't take too much notice of that. And so far as the ACT is concerned, we're seeing that going lower. So overall, investor lending is not growing as fast as unoccupied lending. It does vary across the states, but significantly the momentum in the major states of New South Wales and Victoria looks to me to be slowing. And now we'll look at the first time unoccupied volume and trends. And the first thing to say is that the value is definitely higher than it was a few months ago and it's been growing around 3%. Maybe just slightly lower this time but still pretty strong. But the number of loans taken out is actually sliding slightly. And you can see that the gap between the total value lent and the number of loans lent means that the average loan size is increasing. And here is a chart that just shows that in painful reality. So the average loan size for first time buyers is now 421,202. And that's pretty much as high as it's ever been. And in fact, in New South Wales, we're looking at loans on average for first time buyers sitting at around 500,000, which is remarkably high relative to income, maybe 10 times income. And that shows that we are seeing significant pressure on borrowers as lenders loosen their lending standards and offer bigger loans. And that's in direct response firstly to low interest rates and secondly to APRA's loosening. And you can see similar dynamics across most states where in fact the average loan size for most first-time buyers across most states have got a little bigger in recent times, even in places like Western Australia where there's very little income growth and South Australia. So what does that tell us? Well, it seems to me that the true dynamic is currently that yes, we are seeing some growth in lending. It's worth recalling, of course, that the RBA data earlier on this month highlighted the fact that people were paying down their loans as well. So we've got more loans coming on book. We've also got people paying off loans because they're concerned about the future economic outlook for Australia. So the net net is that the total portfolio size in the banks isn't growing that much. But what we are seeing is that the average loan size is continuing to grow. And that's in direct response to the loosening from APRA and the change of guidance in their loan standards and of course also the fact that the Reserve Bank has cut interest rates. But this is continuing now to build debt and of course we are still in a situation where household debt is very high relative to income and so my concern is that the true story about what's going on in lending is rather different from that advertised. Yet yeah, there is some growth but the risks in the system are still rising because the average loan size is rising. And it's rising at a time when incomes are not rising in real terms. And of course, we also have a range of broader economic issues and uncertainties from coronavirus, the results of the bushfires and slowing economic growth. So as I discussed yesterday, the truth is that everybody is banking on housing to drive the economy. We're seeing it in the data. But the spin that's applied by some analysts doesn't tell the full story.
I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.